And so we just start off by giving God all the glory to God who gives us the ability to get in contact with him, amen. He gives us the ability to come before his throne with boldness, amen. That should have been a rejoicing point because if I would have said, you could have LeBron James' number, you'd be excited. If I said you had Bill Gates' number, some, some people would be excited, amen. No, but I'm telling you, we get the opportunity to call to the God who holds our tomorrow together. He keeps our heart beating. Amen, I gotta find my amen corner like Minister, like, like, uh, Minister Sam said. I gotta find my amen section. Somebody help me preach this thing, amen? Need a little bit of encouragement sometimes, amen? Y'all out there? Glory. So we also wanna give honor to the bishop of the house. Pastor, amen. We want to. I'm excited about the anointing we under, amen. I bet a lot of people that walk with Martin Luther King didn't really know the gravity of what they were standing next to, but I, I'm fully aware of what we under, amen. And it's a good thing. We're making history. We're making history, Israel. And so we give him double honor because he teaches us to walk humbly with our God. He teaches us how to walk with our, that's the best gift you can give to a man, is to teach him how to build, have a relationship with his God. Because like I said, we got, we, got, we got direct access. We can get in touch with him. But it don't matter if you got LeBron's number if you don't have a relationship. You can find his number online. It don't mean he gonna pick up the phone. Amen? I don't think y'all caught it. I don't think y'all caught it. The fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. When you got a relationship, he pick up the phone faster yet. Yeah. So he teaches us to have a relationship with our God. That's worthy of double honor. I thank him for that. I, I salute him when I see him. Amen. So tonight, y'all, we coming off of our series on honor, and we stepping into a new series. Amen. And we're going to do a, this is going to be more of a, like of an of a introductory sermon, amen? We're going to kind of introduce the series, and we're going to kind of introduce the text, and we're going to spend a little bit of time, but it's still going to have some nutrients in it for y'all, amen? I like, to, I like to do series because it gives me time to suck all the nutrients from the text, amen? So I can bring it to you. So it's going to be beneficial still, amen? Y'all with me? Glory, glory. My wife is a teacher, so she tell me, she say, if you want people to learn fast, then teach slow. <laughs> Amen. I say, okay, that's wisdom. I say, okay, I'm gonna just take, I'm gonna take my time. So I'm gonna take my time tonight. Wherever we stop, we just gonna, we gonna wrap it up and we gonna come back. Amen? Amen. Because it's not about how fast we can rush through the text. It's about how we can get that text to rush through us. Amen. Amen. That's what we really aiming for. And so if I had to name this message tonight, I would call it the cry of Israel, the broken cry of Israel. Mmm, broken. Y'all heard Pastor talk about the cry this weekend? I say, man, I say, because we don't know what each other preaching on them. That's the spirit using different vessels to bring one message. I say, my God. That is the Lord because that means that God is returning our cry. He's returning the cry of Israel. That's, a, that's exciting. We're in the middle of a reset. We're in the middle of a dispensation change. He's coming back to his people, amen? But he's returning our cry again. So we have to, when, you, when there's a reset, you gotta relearn everything all over again. You gotta relearn how to honor, you gotta relearn how to Worship, you got to relearn prayer. You got to even relearn how to cry to your God. Amen? Amen? I'm going to tell you there's a cry that no parent can ignore. No parent. There's a certain cry that will make parents hop out of their bed in the middle of the night and run to their child immediately. Understand? And, and listen, there's a difference. That all that whining, no, we know the difference from whining. Sometimes my little children, they be whining. And I'll be like, ah, sometimes they don't even get my attention. But my daughter, that oldest one, she perfected her cry. Oh, Lord, y'all pray for me. Because she know how to cry in a way that's going to provoke daddy to respond. You understand what I'm saying? Mama too? 
Yeah, yeah, and she didn't perfect her cry, especially mama, because if she hear that cry of desperation, she gonna drop everything she doing. I don't care if she cooking, whatever, she, she dropping it, what's going on? I'm telling you, there's a certain cry that'll make a parent respond. And if we could be so tender-hearted towards our children, when they cry to us in their brokenness, then how much more God? When we cry to him from a broken place, amen? We think a mother's love is something, but, mm. and I'm not down in a mother's love because it's something serious. A mama is willing to suffer the pains of death before she even meet the child. She'll prepare a place for the child. She ain't never seen him. She head over heels for the child and he ain't done no right or wrong yet. A mother's love is something serious, but it ain't got nothing on God's love. It don't, we just reflections of his image. Amen, he said, though a mother and father forsake you, I would never. He said, though a mother could forget her sucking child, psh, not me. God say, not me, I never forget mine. Yeah, if they drop you off, I'm going to pick you up. And God is looking from a, for a cry from his children, and not just any type of cry. Not just any type of cry, y'all. What it say in Psalms 51, 17, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a crushed heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. He will not despise our cry when we cry to him the right way. Amen. Thank y'all, brothers. I forgot y'all was playing. I got so used to y'all back there. I, I was enjoying it. I was somewhere else. Amen. I don't want y'all fingers to get tired. They be too broken. Amen. All right. So we're going to be coming out of John 11, verses 4 through 6. If y'all got y'all Bible, I'm going to let y'all turn to it. That's going to be our text for the day. I forgot my water. You never realize you forgot your water till you get up here sometime. Hey, Lord. Well, we ready? We're going to go ahead and read our text. It says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, mm, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And catch this, he says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Mm. But catch this part, he said, now Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And sometimes we think God is just out to get us because he's angry with us, but the Bible says that he loved them. And so he stood still two more days. I'm gonna just let that one marinate for a while. I'm not even going to get, that's going to be later in this year, but I'm going to get to it, though. I just love that part, so I had to stop. Lord God, we pray that you would bless the hearing of your word, that you would bless the expounding of your word, Father God. We pray that you would add your spirit to my words, Father God, because just my words can't do, Father. Put your spirit behind it. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so tonight... We're going to be starting a new series called Blessed and Broken. And we're going to talk about the balance of being both, both blessed and broken and navigating through seasons of suffering. Because it's my conviction that to be effective with the blessing of God, you have to be broken at the feet of God. Amen? Amen? Yes, sir. God likes to use broken things. Did anybody notice God likes to use broken things sometimes? Amen. And I didn't say broke things, all right? <laughs> it's different being broke. <laughs> and brokenness and broke is not the same thing, amen? You can be broke and still not be broken before the feet of God. And I didn't say, I didn't say beat up neither, 
right? Because sometimes we can be beat up. I will, thank you, brother. Thank you, Darius. Sometimes we can, our hearts can be beat up by the world and we could actually be angry with God yes, sir. and still not be broken at the feet of God. Yes, I'm going to tell you, the power of God can never rest on anything that is not broken. The power of God can never rest on anyone who is not broken. Just like a man can't rest on a wild horse that ain't been broken yet, the power of God cannot rest on a man that ain't been broken because the horse still got his own ways. The horse still want to do his own thing, and so the rider can't rest yet. He got to hold it with a tight rein because he ain't broken yet. He still want to do his own thing. And the power of God can't rest on somebody that still want to do their own thing, that still want to do things their way, and they refusing to be led. Amen? Minister, I was talking to Minister Andy, he told me something good. I said, Minister, I'm, I think I'm going to use that one. Because that, <laughs> that one gets straight to the point. He told me a story about the, how they break a horse. And he said they, they tie it to a, a pole sometimes, or they'll just hold a leash. They'll put the leash on them, and they'll just walk it in circles day after day. Every day they'll walk it in circles. And at first, the horse is going to try to get away. He's going to try to get out of it. He's going to try to break loose. But eventually, the horse just begin to walk in circles. You just walk. And they know the horse is broken when his ears fall down and he lower his head like that. But before he do that, sometimes they, they can't work because he'll fake like he didn't, he didn't been broken and he'll try to get away. But when they see his ears fall down and his head duck off, then they know he's not looking to do his own thing no more. The horse is now broken because he don't want to run off and try to do his own thing. He learned how to be led. And sometimes they'll have a whip so he don't get tired, so he keep moving. And sometimes, listen, I wonder how many of us as believers are going in circles because we're refusing to be led. Israel walked around the desert on a 40-day journey for 40 years and never made it to their destination because they refused to be broken. They refused to be led. Amen? Sometimes we can be like that. We can be like that sometimes, y'all. But before God will make you, he going to break you. Before God will make you a boss, he's going to make you an employee. Before God make you a king, many times he's going to make you a servant. You know, David had to serve under Saul before he became king. Joseph had to be a servant before he was able to rule over Egypt. Many times God want to see if you can be faithful with another man's things before he give you your own. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times we have to be under before we can be over. You have to learn to follow before you can lead. And this is good for Israel because Israel has been a slave in all her generations to every nation, to every people. But I love how the scriptures say that the last shall be first. Because as Israel has served every nation and every people, one day Israel is going to rule over every nation and every people group. And it's going to be an eternal reign. Amen? That's, ooh, that's good news. That's good news. But before God can trust you with power, a lot of times you got to be found faithful with weakness. It's the truth. And if you refuse to be under, then you actually forfeit your ability to be over. If you refuse to be broken, then you forfeit your ability to be effective with the blessing. A lot of times, we try to run away from brokenness in order to remain comfortable, and we miss the fact that the brokenness and the blessing go hand in hand. Actually, the secret to being effective with the blessing is hidden in brokenness. I'm going to say that one more time, slow. I got to listen to my wife. She said, teach slow. All right? The, uh, the secret to being effective with the blessing is hidden in brokenness. Hey, Lord. So why are we talking about this, brother? Huh? Why, why do you feel like this is important? Yeah, I knew you all would ask that. I knew it. I felt it in my spirit. Amen? Because we all going to go through seasons of suffering. 
We all going to have to go through seasons of suffering. Whether it's today or tomorrow, listen, whether that loved one going to go today or wherever it is, you lose that. We all going to go through suffering. I'm going to show it to you by scripture, right? I don't want to just say stuff. I like to go get scripture me. Mm-hmm. In Hebrews 12, 6 through 7, he says this. He says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourges every son whom he receive. That word scourge mean it going to hurt. It don't feel good. All right? All right? Just so y'all know. And he says, if ye endure chastening, God can deal with you as sons. If you endure the chastening. But if you begin to fight back and grab the belt, you just extended your whipping. You understand? And we all going to go through. He said he scourges every son that he receives. So no matter how much we try to pretend like it's all good and we got on our church mask, he said every son, everybody. Amen? And so I know we like to talk about the blessing, but I would do you a disservice not to try to equip you for seasons of suffering. Amen? To not talk about seasons of suffering. It's been my experience that since the main theme is blessings, there's a group that would rather suffer in silence rather than not fit in. Y'all hear me? Some, some people would rather just suffer in silence because they don't want to mess the theme up. But the problem is as they suffer in silence, they lose in hope. They grow in bitter when they need to be together. All right? We, we, we need to be one. Amen? And they think that they curse by God sometimes as they suffer and they lose hope. Israel probably thought she was cursed by God all of these years of suffering. But it's actually because she's blessed of God that she actually goes through suffering. He chasing those he loves. Amen? And he says in Hebrews 12, 5, he says, And ye have forgotten the divine word of encouragement, which is addressed to you as sons. He says, My son, do not make light of the discipline of the Lord. And do not lose heart or give up when you are corrected by him. Because it's a good thing. When God corrects you, it's actually a good thing. It may not feel good, but it is good. Because it's important to notice about God. Lamentations 3.32, he says, he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. God don't like hurting nobody. That's what the Bible says. He don't like to bring affliction on nobody. So we got to begin to ask ourselves, then, what's the method behind the madness? Because there's a message behind the suffering. He's either trying to put something in you or get something out of you. You got to begin to ask yourself, so what's the common theme? Do I have a temper issue? Am I dealing with lust? Am I dealing with trust? What is it that God is trying to get out of me? This might not be a hallelujah message, but it's going to be a, it's, it's a medicine tonight. Amen? It's okay that we quiet tonight because it's a medicine. It's one of them type of days, huh? Because no, no discipline feels good in the moment. I understand it. There's no discipline that feels good in the moment. But just like a child can look back after he grow up and go back to his daddy and say, Daddy, I respect how you raised us. I respect how you, how you, you put the rod on us because it, it made us something better. Amen. Amen? It didn't feel good in the moment, but it made us something better. Protection don't always feel good in the moment. Somebody telling you, no, you can't go here. No, take that off. Don't go over there. That don't feel good in the moment, but hindsight, they say, is 20 is 20. Amen? Let's look at Hebrews 12, 10. It says this. For they verily, your parents, for a few days chastened. They chastened us after their own pleasure. They, chased, they whipped us because they was upset. All right? They got upset with us. But God says, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. God ain't doing it because he want to whip you. God is doing it so that you can be a partaker of something. He's trying to get something into you. He wants you to partake in his holiness. But the Bible says, now no chastening for the present time seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, it yielded a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Righteousness. <laughs> That's the other part of the song. Amen. That brokenness produces righteousness. And he says, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down 
and strengthen those feeble knees, he's saying, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, lest you get discouraged and get diverted by depression, by fear. Let something take you out of the path. He said, strengthen that which is weak, but let it rather be healed, looking diligently, lest any man fell of the grace of God. Least any of your brothers are stumbling. Least any of your people are struggling with depression. Look out for them and least le they fell from the grace of God. Amen? He says, looking diligently, least any man fell of the grace of God. Least any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And he says, and thereby many be defiled. Many people stumble with this issue. I'm here to talk to the many tonight. I might not get an amen, but I'm here to talk for the many, the many that, get, that, that have to deal with this or dealing with some depression or dealing with some type of struggle. I'm here to talk to the many tonight, amen? amen. And I want to tell you, you're not alone. We all have our season of struggle, all right? Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you're not alone. You're not alone. No. God loves you. I'm going to just take a moment to tell you God loves you. People may struggle translating that love, you know. They may be agitated by you. People may struggle with that. Sometimes I want to choke people sometimes. Y'all pray for me. But the Lord, he often reminds me. He say, listen, you know where I found you at, right? You know how you was? You see them? And I say, oh, God, you, you know how to humble me. <laughs> so you offended, but, but remember what you did to me? And I say, God, oh, I am them. I'm upset with them right now, but God, I am them. If I would have grew up in their exact situation, I wouldn't be no different. And I go from like angry to like, I wish I could just hug them. I wish I could just, because I needed to know that love was real. I, it's broken people that break people. It, it's because we broken that we actually act the way we act and we want it. We trying to see if love is actually real. And I just want to rug up, I want to run up and say, it's going to be all right. No, it's going to be all right. I know where you're at. Hey, God. Because somebody had to do that for me. When I first walked in here, the way pastor grabbed you and hugged you. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I ain't never been nobody hugged me like that. <laughs> it make you think twice. But a lot of times when we look at people, we don't see ourselves. But the Bible tells us, he says, Treat other, way, other people the way you desire to be treated. All right? He said, this is the whole law in a nutshell. If you want to know the law, he said, just treat other people the way you desire to be treated. Not how you treat yourself, but how you desire to be treated. All right? And some people don't treat themselves right. Amen? So, the caveat is to say, the way you desire. Amen? And so, just reminding y'all, y'all not alone because, look, we all may look different. But the struggle is the same. It's facts. I'm going to show you by scripture in a second. Because we can dress up in pretty church clothes, but we still got flesh underneath. That's the truth. And so rejoice, y'all. Don't, don't, don't be weary. Don't be weary because you're not the only one going through. In 1 Peter 5, verses 9 through 10, I'm going to show it to you by scripture. He say, stand firm against him meaning the devil, and be strong in your faith and remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Because in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, the Bible says, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. He will place you on a firm foundation. Can I tell you that God knows the plans that he has for you? It may hurt, but he has a plan. He knows what he's doing. You just got to let patience have his perfect work. Because after he's finished, he's going to establish you. It's a method of God. It's a mode of operandi that he has. And I want to show it to you. Amen? Y'all still out there? We're not only called to reign with Christ, but we also called to suffer with him. We're not only partakers of his grace, but we're partakers of his suffering. In Philippians 1.29, he says, For ye have been 
given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. In Romans 8, 17, and if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. But if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. What is he saying? He's saying if we struggle together, we're going to bubble together, baby. I want to, that's how they say that, huh? If we struggle together, we're going to bubble together. Because God is looking to see not only who want to reign with him, but who's willing to be broken with him. One more, because I, I, in the presence of three witnesses, I like to do three at least. He says in 2 Corinthians 1, 7, he says, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. So there's a consolation prize <laughs> for your suffering. Anybody remember Job? Y'all remember how that ended with him? His suffering was not in vain. Anybody remember David? His end was better than his beginning. Joseph ended up in prison, but his end was better than his beginning. There's a consolation to this thing if you're willing to endure. Does that make sense? Yes, I want to make sure you are with me. Because a lot of friends, y'all, a lot of friends, they want to be around when there's glory to be had. They're ready to jump on the bandwagon. Everybody want to be on the bandwagon when there's some glory involved. But when the tire busts and fall off, people just hop off and don't even offer to change the tire. It's like, whoa. God said, ah, we're not doing this time. We're not going to do that this time, Israel. Because you, you you're used to getting blessed and you forget the Lord your God. But he said, I got something for you this time. He said, behold, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. He said, this time we're going to be baptized by fire. I want to see who really love me like they say they love me. This is it, and I'm just showing you his heart. Don't stone me. I'm just showing you his heart, amen? But I know y'all the Tuesday crowd. Y'all love the word. I know y'all too. Y'all press for the Lord. Hey, Lord. Glory. So let me give y'all the foundation behind this blessed and broken thing. I want to give y'all the spiritual principle behind it. There's a funny thing that Jesus would do that I want us to focus on. He had a pattern or way about himself when it came to breaking bread. Amen? And I want us to focus on it. He said something funny. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And I said, hmm. I said, ain't we also the body? <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord, this, is, this might be a message to the body. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And anytime I see something once in the scripture, it's an Amen. Anytime I see it twice in the scripture, it's a verily, verily type of moment. Anytime I see it three times, I'm going to get some popcorn because I know there's a message. (laughs) And is that what I'm saying? Anytime I see it three times, I hang on to my seat. And so the first place we see this, this formula that he does, we see it in Matthew 14, 19, when he feeds the multitude with the two fishes and the loaves. We notice that he takes the bread He blesses the bread, and then he begins to break the bread and then feed it to the people in the wilderness to sustain those who came out to hear his word. And then we see it in another place at the Last Supper in Matthew 26, 26. We see the same thing. We see that he takes the bread, he chooses the bread, he blesses the bread, but then he breaks the bread. And then he gives it to his people, and he says, this is my body. I said, hmm, verily, verily. And then we see it again on on the road to Emmaus. When he's talking to his disciples, he decides to stop and break bread with them, literally. And he does it again. He, let's pull it up. I want to see it. Luke 24, 30. He does it again. He chooses the bread. He blesses the bread. He breaks it, and then he gives it to the people. And this time, the Bible says, and then their eyes were opened after receiving the broken bread, after receiving the broken body of Jesus Christ. The Bible says their eyes were opened. And a lot of times I think we're not broke. Why eyes are not opening is because we're not broken enough. You know, glory to God. 
when people see how we live not selfishly but broken before one another, not having our own ways but looking out for one another, the Bible says that they will know you by the love that you have for one another. But when it's not there, eyes ain't going to be open like you think because they waiting to see if love is real. They waiting to see their father because they have a scent of his presence. They don't know how to explain it, but they waiting to see what they know. This love that they've never seen, they expecting it. They waiting to see us broken, amen? And Jesus had a little thing that he does. And this is his MO. Out through all, all, all the scriptures, he would choose David, bless David, and then begin to break David so that he can use David. He would choose Joseph, bless Joseph, and then he would break Joseph so that he can use Joseph. He would choose Jacob, bless Jacob, break Jacob so he can use him. And the same thing with Job. The same thing with Daniel. Name him off. He has a process. You understand? It's a proven process that he has. It's a proven process. And I thought to myself, I said, man, and if he had never broken the bread, he couldn't reach as many people. And he had 12 people he had to feed, so the bread had to be broken 12 ways. The more broken, the more people he was reaching. And I said, man, Jesus also reached me in his brokenness. The Bible says that he, he, was, he suffered in every way that man could suffer, being made a perfect high priest so he could speak to our brokenness and walk us into the love of God. Let me read the scripture. I don't like just saying it. I'm going to read it. In Hebrews 2.17, if y'all could pull it up. He said, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Through all of his suffering, sinless, suffered, but sin not. Yes, Let's be clear about that. So that he could better speak to us in our situations, in our brokenness. Anybody hear me? Yeah. It's, it's through the brokenness. And, and God, too, with us, through our brokenness, he teaches us to rely on him and to be more compassionate to other people around us. It's through the brokenness. In 2 Corinthians 1, 4, it says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we may comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So it's not just the blood of the lamb, but it's the power of your testimony. What have you been through? Yes, sir. Amen? Because nobody can speak to the broken like the broken. Nobody can speak to somebody that's depressed like somebody that's been depressed before. You understand what I'm saying? It's through your brokenness that you can reach more people. So don't despise your brokenness. Amen? We moving on along, y'all. We moving on along. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1, 6, he says, Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and for your salvation. When we are weighed down by God, when God pushes us into intentional suffering, it's so that he can begin to show us how to walk with those around us. He's just teaching us to rely on him in every situation. Paul says something good. He says, uh, he says indeed, in 2 Corinthians 1.9, he says, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. In him, we are made indestructible. It's in him, though, when we learn to rely on his strength and not our own. Though we be pressed on every side, we not crushed. Though we be cast down, we can't be destroyed. Though we might be confused, we never in disarray. Because in him, we more than just overcomers. We more than just conquerors. We're indestructible. Let me tell you something. When God breaks you, the world can never break you. That's a wrap. After you've been broken by God, the world cannot break you no more. You become indestructible to the world. Amen? 
Is that helping somebody? I'm trying to speak to a particular person tonight. Hey, God. Amen. And so instead of, instead of complaining about our brokenness, we got to learn to embrace it. Instead of taking up complaints, we got to learn to take up notepads and begin to document. I'm trying to give somebody a book idea tonight. Yeah, Job said, oh, that there was a book that was written to document what I'm going through. Y'all don't remember, this is where we get the Psalms from. Document it. David documented his struggle. Amen? So we got to learn to find value not only in the blessing, but in brokenness as well, because it is. Both are needed. I'm going to tell you that both are needed. Both the ups and the downs in life are needed. He said there's a, there's a time for everything under the sun. There's a purpose for every work. There's a place for the downs and the ups. He says there's a time to live and a time to die. There's a time to kill and there's a time to make alive. There's a time to plant and there's a time to pluck up what you planted. Yes, sir. There's a time for everything that is going to balance you out because all of these things work together. They don't work in isolation. They work together for the good of those that love God. Amen. Your pain ain't going to push you away from God. It's going to press you into God. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. When you begin to understand the purpose of the pain, it's going to make you love God even more. It's going to make nothing going to Nothing can separate you from the hand of God. Not life, death, angels, whatever it is. Nothing can separate you. So you can get that out of your head. If you gave it to Jesus, that's a wrap. Both the good and the bad. If you love God and are called according to his purpose, how many of y'all love God? How many of y'all called to be in alignment with his purpose? Amen? So everything is meant to work together for your good. It's meant to work together for your good. Amen? Amen? If you really believe the scripture, then it should change how you look at suffering. It should, you shouldn't look at it the same because your weakness is actually an opportunity to appreciate the strength of God. You know, if everybody hadn't left you alone, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but if everybody hadn't left you alone, you would never realize that you're never alone. You would have never had the opportunity. If everybody hadn't walked away, you wouldn't have the opportunity to notice that God is in the room. Amen. If he hadn't let it all fall apart, then you wouldn't know that only he can put it all back together. Sometimes it's a blessing to be in the lion's den because you get to see that God can shut the mouth of the lion. And so this is what Mary and Martha are dealing with. God gave them the opportunity to see that he is the resurrection. He is the life. And he didn't go meet her in her pity party. He didn't come meet her where she was sobbing. No, she, he, he waited at the tomb. He said, come meet me with your problem. I don't want to meet you at, at your pity party. I want to meet you at your situation. And he gave her an opportunity to bring her problems to him. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to bring our problems to him, amen? Because when you can't and nothing else can, it gives you an opportunity to appreciate the God who can. The woman with the issue of blood didn't have nowhere else to go. She tried everything, but it pushed her into Jesus. She began to seek the one who could, amen? And so darkness, darkness actually highlights a flashlight. The flashlights work better in the darkness, to be honest with you. They do. They do, and Eve would have never been able to appreciate the tree of life if she hadn't eat, eaten from that tree that produced death in her life. It's through eating that tree that she realized, man, I need God more than I thought. You can't have value for some things. You can't appreciate the ups until you've been down in life. Amen, and so we're gonna look at our text. We're gonna look at our text in verse three, and we wanna start off in verse three. We're not skipping one and two, but we're going to double back to one and two. But we want to start off in three because three is where we see her first response in her season of suffering. The Bible says she sent unto Jesus. She sent unto him. She sent her cry to the Lord. Her first response was prayer. 
And that has to be our first response, our second response, and our third response, even our continual response. It has to be prayer. We have to be able to run to Jesus with our cry. Stop running to people, run to Jesus with our cry. But they're going through a season, y'all. They're going through a season of suffering. They're going through a season of loss. They're going through a season of confusion. They hurt. They just lost the very thing that they love the most. Maybe not the most, but they love their brothers. And they're going through a hurtful season. Anybody ever been through a season like that? Yeah. But Yahshua said, this season ain't going to end in death. There's going to be some more episodes. <laughs> the season ain't going to end like this. It ain't going to end on a cliffhanger. And he said, this is just a season. It's just a season. And seasons don't last forever. Sometimes we feel like for now is forever. And God is like, no. He's like, God, I can't deal with this forever. I can't put up with this relationship forever. I can't do this forever. And God is saying, forever, it's, it's just for now, son. It's just, it's a season. We got to realize it's a season and we got to get good at letting go and just letting God. Amen. We got to get good at letting go and letting God. Amen. Either we're going to trust them or we're not. But we got to make that decision whether we're going to trust them or not. Because until we let some things be knocked down, then God will never have the opportunity to rebuild it. God can't revive what you refuse to let die. He going to revive what you don't want to let die. That's, that's you. you mm -mm. Sometimes we're afraid to let go of things because when we let go, we lose control. And once we lose control, we push ourselves into the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen next. And that's uncomfortable for us as humans. But it's necessary. It's necessary because when we hold on to it, what we're telling God is that we can do a better job than him. You think it's safer in your hands because you think you, you can be him. You got more foreknowledge. We got more wisdom. And it's offensive to God. And if we have that mindset, then have we really died to ourselves? Have we really surrendered to God and become broken? Or are we still holding on? Because in life, you're only going to receive what you're willing to let go of. The Bible says you got to give to receive. The Bible says he that loses his life is going to be the one that's going to find it. It's a secret mystery. If you're not willing to let go, you're not willing to get anything in life. Amen. Hey, God. Anybody hear me out there? I want to make sure y'all still with me. I got to check in every once in a while. Don't make it too quiet. Give me, give me an amen every once in a while. Make me feel like I'm alone up in here. Amen. <laughs> But the effectiveness of our cry is tied to our ability to be broken. All right? The effectiveness of our cry is tied to our ability to be broken. I want to read this scripture again. Psalms 51, 17. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. It's a broken heart. And so I got a question. Anybody in here want to be a living sacrifice? I heard the song say a living sacrifice earlier. How many of us want to be a living sacrifice? I didn't see no hands go up. <laughs> Anybody want to be a living sacrifice? Because I know it's not easy. Some hands like, yeah, I don't know, maybe so. You know, if that's what he wants, Lord, you know. Yeah, but he's looking for a living sacrifice. But the thing about being a living sacrifice, you know God likes his sacrifices dead. Mmm, that's hard. Ooh, that's hard. He likes his sacrifices dead. It's not an acceptable sacrifice until it's dead. Dead to his own ways, dead to his own desires, not self-willed, not wanting to do his own thing. That's what I'm saying when I say dead. He likes his, his things, you know. But again, revival can't happen until death occurs. Yeah. Yeah. How you going to revive something that ain't dead? It don't need to be revived. We scream, we want revival. And he like, listen, you need to die to your own ways. You're still too alive to get revival. He, he, yeah, we want revival, but we don't want to be broken. 
I'm trying to help. This is going to do good in the long run. It's tough tonight, but in the long run, this thing is going to work like a medicine. Amen? I'm unlocking stuff in the heart, okay? It's a tough thing, but we're going to unlock it, amen? They got Yeah, but God likes his things dead. And so by death, I want to explain that because I don't want y'all to be all like, oh, he keeps saying the word death. Uh, I want to explain what that, that death is just a disconnect from your source of life. When you disconnect a tree from its source, it's dead. It just look alive, but it's disconnected from its source. And sometimes we have other things that we think are our source. We, we think that relationship is the source of our joy. We think that job is the source of our provision and our peace. And sometimes God needs you to disconnect from those things that you think are giving you life so you can reconnect to him who is your real source. Amen. He is the I am in every situation. Everything you need him to be in every moment, he is the I am. Amen. And he wants to disconnect you from some things so he can reconnect you to himself. And so sometimes he'll shake things up. He'll make you disconnect. And it's just a temporary discomfort for a lasting hope. For eternal joy. It's just like taking a blanket from a little kid. Yeah, they're going to fuss over it for a little while, but until you come with something better. He's just trying to give us something better, but we got to be willing to die to the old thing. But it's only for a moment. I'm trying to tell you because I want y'all to take it easy. I, I don't want y'all to be scared of the thing. That word death ain't a scary thing. It's just disconnecting. It's just disconnecting. Amen. Is it helping anybody? Sometimes letting go can be the hardest thing you ever going to do. It can be hard to let some things go. But I want to tell you, it's also the easiest thing just to just let go. It's such a relief just to let go. Stop holding on with all of you. It takes a lot of strength to hold on, yeah. Letting go can be one of the easiest things you're ever going to do. The art of letting go. Because when you let go, you open yourself up to receive God's way. Until you're willing to let go of your own perfection, you're not going to receive God's perfection. Until you're willing to let go of your own ways, you're not making room for God's ways. You're trying to fit God into your broken heart. And he's too big for that. He wants to remold that broken heart. Amen? Amen? God is looking for somebody who has total reliance on him. He wants us to have total reliance. But sometimes disconnecting from what we believe is our source, it can, it can feel like a tough thing. But holding on to what you think is your source, it can hurt you in the long run. Anybody remember Ananias and Sapphira? Yes, they went to give it away, but they were still holding on to what they thought was their source, and they lost everything. We got to learn to let go. It can be hard, but they lost everything in that moment because God thoroughly showed them that he was their source. Yes, and so that was offensive to God when you're still holding on to that thing. But I know why it happens. It happens to us due to a spirit of fear. We let the spirit of fear convince us that if we let go, we're going to die. But guess what? God has not given us a spirit of fear. And I want to tell you a secret that on the other side of that fear, your purpose is there. Because that spirit that didn't come from God usually waits at your purpose to block you off so you never find it. Your purpose is hiding on the other side of your fear somewhere. Listen to me when I say this. I'm going to read this scripture, and I don't want you to get up and go to the bathroom on this one. I want you to really hear this one. Okay? <laughs> Hebrews 2, 14, 15. Because I want to show you why Jesus, this is a big deal to him. This is a big deal to God. So it's a big deal to me. He says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them through fear of death, through fear of disconnecting. 
He says, through fear of death, they were subject, they were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Through fear. Jesus came down to deliver you from your fears. It was that big of a deal. He said, no, nah, I'm going to put on flesh and I got to move this thing out of the way. Because all their lifetime, they subject to bondage through fear. They're like, yeah, Jesus, we're going to follow you after we get off of work. Because we got to, I mean, I wouldn't feel safe. Phil be saying, hey, we're going we to start a revolution on the weekend when we off of work. <laughs> they were subject. Sometimes, listen, we find ourselves bound to situations. Jobs, people, ideas, places, because we're scared. We're scared that if we leave or we do something else, we're going to disconnect from our source. And that spirit of fear can keep you bound to some strange things sometimes. But tonight, I'm just going to expose that spirit of fear and show you what's happening. If that thing ain't got nothing to do with your purpose, let it go. Amen? Amen. Fear sometimes can keep us bound, and we'll find ourselves fighting for our bondage. He says, the men in the scripture, they say, we have never been bound. We Abraham's seed. And if you say you whole, then you don't need a physician. If you say you can see, then you don't need sight from God. But let me tell you a secret about Jesus. He came to set the captives free. He came to heal the blind. He came to heal the sick. How many people know that they need Jesus? He came for people who know they need him. He came for people that's broken and they know they need for him. Does that make sense to anybody? He came for those who know that they need him. Love wants to be needed, y'all. The spirit of love wants to be needed. If I feel like I'm not needed somewhere, I'm going to just leave. The spirit of love wants to be wanted. If I feel like I'm not wanted, I'm, you know, I'm going to just go. Amen? Amen? There's only two ways to receive the power of God, and that's through righteousness and brokenness. And the funny thing about humanity is we don't really tip that righteous scale. So our best option is to just be broken before God. That's just our best option, y'all. Paul said, knowing this thing, he's like, man, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm boast in my weakness so that the grace of Christ can rest upon me. Notice that the, gra the grace of Christ rests when you're willing to admit your weakness. But if you say you don't need him, it ain't going to rest. He said, knowing this, man, I'm going to boast in my weakness so that the grace of Christ can rest. When we confess, the glory can rest. Amen? Amen? So that death that we experience in life is not a, it's not a period. It's actually a comma with our God. It's actually a comma, but we find ourselves sometimes stuck in transition. We find ourselves stuck in transition on the way to the blessing, like Israel who died off in the wilderness. We find ourselves stuck in transition, whether we're stuck in anger, whether we're stuck in doubt, whether we're stuck in unbelief, we find ourselves just stuck in transition. And that's a rough place sometimes, y'all. That's a rough place to be. But I like Mary and Martha's response. They prayed. In the middle of their situation, they sent their request to Jesus. And prayer is important, y'all. Prayer is super important. Because if we don't master this art of prayer, of crying to our God, then we're going to be like a deer caught in the headlights when our season of suffering comes. Amen? Amen. We're going to be like a soldier in the middle of a war with no radio to phone home. And if that radio don't phone home the base, then it's just a piece of plastic. And that's what our prayer life is like when we, when we can't reach heaven. Amen? Because the power is not in the prayer. The power is in God who answers the prayer. Amen? And if that connection point is broken, then you can't call for backup. You can't call for an airstrike. You can't call for an extraction point. Jesus said, you think I can't call my father and send legions of angels? Elijah did one better. He said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down. He called the airstrike. Amen. And it's the same Elijah that prayed and the rain stopped for three years. Then he prayed again and the rain started again. Daniel, he prayed and heaven began to move. 
The angel Gabriel came down and said, at the beginning of your prayer, the commandment came forth for me to come to you. There was a man who turned to the wall and cried out to his God, and his life was extended by 15 years. I'm talking about the power of prayer, y'all. This is the power of prayer. It's, it's, it's not a light thing. It's not a light thing at all, y'all. And we see that Jesus actually, Jesus loved his time in prayer with his God. Amen. He loved his time in prayer. He would always escape for his time in prayer. The disciples, they would cover their time in prayer. They said, it's not good for us to wait tables. We need to be given to prayer and ministry of the word. We got to spend time with God. Amen. They value prayer because prayer is not just an opportunity to get into the presence of God. It's an opportunity to call the presence of God down to earth. Oh, I hope y'all hear me on that. Because as ambassadors of the kingdom, did you know that we have early access to the kingdom? We can call things down from heaven. The man of God said, silver and gold I don't have, but let me give you what I do have. Get up and be healed. He said, there, healing is the children's bread. Before they came into a house, they say, let your peace rest on the house. Let the peace of the kingdom. When you walk into a room, let them know that the kingdom of God is at hand. You as an ambassador, you have access to revelation. You have access to comfort. You have access to joy, hope. All of the things of the kingdom, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, the Bible says. He want to give you all of these things. Remember what the scriptures say? Let thy will be done on earth as it is. He want to transfer some things to earth, but we disconnect it. Mm. And a lot of times we miss the power of prayer, y'all. So we don't laugh at people stumbling in the dark. We show them the light of the kingdom. Amen. Show them the love of God. Amen. God want heaven to reflect earth. God want earth to reflect heaven. Let me not say that wrong. Y'all know what I mean by the spirit. Amen. Big hey God. And so listen, y'all, when we figure this thing out, when we learn to have effective prayer, when we learn to have impactful prayer, the devil not going to be able to have control over our situations. We almost do it. The devil not going to be able to have control over our situation. When Israel remembers how to cry to her God, it's over with. But they stole our cry. We've forgotten how to cry as a people. Do you know the whole book of Judges was a book teaching us the power of our cry? When you go look at Jesus, I mean, uh, judges, look at Jesus too, but judges, over and over again, they would cry to their God, then he would raise up a deliverer. I, mean, I want to show it to you. I want to show it to you. I like going to the scripture. In Judges 3, 9, Judges chapter 3, verse 9, and hopefully we can get it up because I want y'all to see it, but I'm going to read it to you. And he says, and when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them. That's in Judges 3.9. We go down to Judges 3.15 in another section. He says, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up them a deliverer named Ehud, the son of Jerah. If we go to the next chapter in Judges 4.3, he said, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And he raised up another deliverer, y'all. If we go unto Judges 6, uh, verse 6, he says, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord sent a prophet to him. And so we see over and over again in the scripture, they would get in trouble, and then they would cry to their God. And God, tender in mercy, would raise up a deliverer. I don't think we know the power of our cry. I don't, think we, I don't think we understand we can just cry to our God when we're in the midst of a situation. Jonah knew this power. He said, man, I'm not going to Nineveh. You already didn't place the cry on the inside of the people. I mess around and show up. God, I know you, you're tender and mercy. You're going to forgive them. He said, I'm not going. I already know you, God. We see Cain, not even Cain, just killed his brother. And he said, God, this is too much for me. 
God say, whoever touched Cain got to go through me. But God, he just killed his brother. But he cried unto me. He brought his problem to me. And all who call upon, God is merciful unto all who call upon. We just ain't figured out how to bring our problems to him just yet. But we in the middle of a reset and we got to learn our cry again. If we learn this cry again, God, it's over. And that word cry there in the Hebrew is za'ok. It means to cry out, to call, a call of distress or need or to summon. Did you know our tears have a language? Amen. There was an experiment that where you would play these sounds for, for women, right? And it would be sounds of babies crying and they each had their own situation going on. One needed a diaper change, one just was hungry. So I said, I'm gonna try that on my wife. I said, babe, what would that sound mean? He said, sound like he hungry. Well, that one sound like he needed, he needed his diaper change. And you know what, she got every one of them right? And I said, wait a minute, that's not, why come I only hear a cry? <laughs> How do you hear actual language? Like, wh where are you getting this information from? And there's a certain cry that God is looking for from us. There's a certain cry, y'all. Hey, God. He placed the cry on the inside. And God is not looking for us to cry out from this shell. This shell when you cry from this shell, it'll move the world. Yeah, the world will be moved by our tears. When I cry out from my soul, it'll move other people's soul. But when I learn to cry out from my spirit, it's going to move heaven. Because deep calls to deep. Deep calls to deep, y'all. Paul talks about this. He says he talks about a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow in 2 Corinthians 7, 10. And we almost do it, y'all. He says, a godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but a sorrow of the world worketh death. And so there's two different sorrows. He says, a sorrow that the world produces is useless, but a sorrow that God produces leads to salvation. And so I'm not talking about a worldly cry. I'm talking about a cry that comes from deep, from our brokenness. It's not birthed from this world, but it's something that overflows into our heart and overflows out of our mouth. Have you ever had something move your spirit so strong that your eyes begin to leak, but your brain don't know what's going on? Yeah, it's that type of cry. It's that type of cry, amen? The Bible says in, uh, the Bible says in Galatians 4, 6, he says, and because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Amen. He placed something on the inside. Just like deep calls to deep, spirit calls to spirit. Amen. And so when we begin to reach to him, that's when God is going to answer. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a cry based on our works, y'all. It's not a cry based on our righteousness. It's, it's a cry that's based on his mercy. Not nothing we could do. It's just based on his mercy. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. It says Psalms 86. He says, he is pleasant he, and he is plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. In Psalms 145, 18, 19. I don't know if they're putting it up there, but I'm going to read it. That's that. And he sends his spirit into our heart crying. Amen. But uh, Psalms 1, 4, 5, verses 18, 18 through 19, he says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. One more. Exodus 22, verses 20 through 24. Pastor read this one this weekend. And he says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. He says, if thou afflict them in any wise, and they at all cry unto me, because God has a soft spot for the fatherless yes, and the widow. And that goes to show when you have a relationship, he hears the cries more direct. He said, if they at all cry unto me, yes, he said, I'm a, 
I'm going to answer from heaven. Because why? Why does he answer? Let's go to that last verse in verse 27. He said, it shall come to pass when they cry it unto me, I will hear. Why? Because I'm gracious. He said, that's the reason I'm answering their cry, because it's about who I am. It's not about who they are. It's about who I am. Amen. And so this is the secret, y'all. I'm going to rush through it because we're right there at the end. He said, this is the secret, because God delights to deliver those that trust him. I just want to tell y'all that secret. He delights to deliver those that trust him. And so the secret is to begin to strengthen our trust in him, to begin to fortify our mind, to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Amen. To begin to police our thoughts and magnify the Lord in our heart because he's looking for a certain type of thing. He's looking for a certain type of cry. Amen. He's looking for those who know that they need him, who are willing to humble themselves at his word, to correct themselves at his reproof. Amen. Not people that think they got it all figured out. Amen. He's looking for a broken cry. And this is the last one. He says, Psalms 145, 18. He says, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. If you have cried unto the Lord, like Mary did, like Martha did, you don't have to worry about your situation. If you cried out, he may seem like he late, but he do things on his own time. Just let him have his way. But if you haven't called on him tonight, there's an opportunity to call. From a broken place, there's an opportunity to call unto your God. Because he says this in Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No if, ands, or buts about it. If you call to him, you shall be saved. He said, if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you could admit that you're a sinner, that you're prone to evil, you're prone to sin. If you admit, if you believe in your heart that Jesus came into the world and died and rose on the third day, that God intervened into humanity, if you believe that, you already got one foot in the door. All you have to do is confess. Jesus as Lord, is he the Lord of your life? Even when you don't agree, even above your opinion, is he still Lord? Because if that's true, he says you shall be saved. You don't have to doubt your salvation. You don't have to second guess it. So I'm gonna give an opportunity right now for you to cry unto your God. And I'm not, I don't wanna do it for you. I just wanna leave a space for you to cry, to admit to God that we've sinned that we've fallen short of your glory, Father God, and we need your salvation. Just take 30 seconds and just pray to yourself. Pray to your God, amen, and just ask him. God, teach me how to cry again, Father God. Teach us how to cry as a people, Father God. Teach us to value you like we ought. Our hallelujah belongs to you. Our cry belongs to you. Everything that we have belongs to you, God. Hear their cries on tonight. Hear their hearts, Father God, and save those, Father God, who are crying to you right now. Deliver them, God. Deliver them, Daddy. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. That's it, y'all. Was that painful or was that okay? That was all right? Okay. Glory, y'all. Love y'all. Be blessed. Hey. Yeah, my brother. Appreciate it. Let me get this thing.